Oh, how have we gotten to this place? The Eastern and Western Conference Finals, <laughs> both in disarray. Seku Smith from the Hang Time Podcast here at headquarters in Atlanta. My main man, John Schumann, on location in Cleveland, trying to figure out if this is it for the King. Has LeBron seen the last of his trips to the conference finals with the Cavaliers? Um, Shu, I'm working on fumes. I'm going to admit it. I was at the airport in Houston this morning at like four, and I apologized to the people who were sitting next to me for snoring and slobbing on them all the way to Atlanta. Chris Paul, man. Unbelievable effort and performance. The Houston Rockets are up 3-2. They have the the reigning champs, the three-time defending Western Conference champion Golden State Warriors on the brink of elimination. I can't believe I'm saying that. They've won two straight. Yeah, but you say you say like both series are in disarray. Heck, the, the top seeds are up 3-2 in both series. I know, which which is right, disarray. Normal, because, right? No, because <laughs> the, the Cavaliers and the Warriors are, are both a game away from not Seeing each other for a four P. I mean, and listen, let's not bury the lead. Chris Paul's right hamstring is an issue that could potentially keep him out of Game Six Saturday night at Oracle. Could impact that series dramatically. James Harden hasn't made a three pointer since I had uh, no gray hair. I mean, he's, it's unbelievable that the guy who's the front runner for the Kia MVP cannot make a three pointer all of a sudden. I tweeted last night that you know Jason Kidd retired when he missed eleven <laughs> straight threes to. Uh, <laughs> And the Knicks playoff run back in whatever it was, 2012 or whatever it was. Well, Harden's not retired. Harden, Harden's, what, at 20? Yeah, oh, he's, yeah, he's not retiring. But, I mean, literally, the air goes out of the building when he pulls up for a three and it goes sideways. I mean, it's stunning yeah. that he can't make a three-pointer all of a sudden. But we'll get to the West in, in a minute. Let's focus here all of our attention, as should everyone in Northeast Ohio, on LeBron James – his energy, and can he drag these Cavaliers back to even and force a Game 7 against the Celtics? The, look, Boston at home, the Showtime Lakers don't want any of this Boston team at home. You know, they, I'm stunned at how well they play in the Garden compared to how they perform away from there. I understand that everybody always, you know, leans on this theory that, you know, role players play better at home. Everybody's more comfortable in front of the home crowd, but really – is that all it is, you? You know what? It's funny. It's you know, I, it's I look at it as like how well they've played in the at home is more true to them. And like I look at games three and four of this series as like what were the Celtics doing? Like you know, I thought game four they came out flat and stayed that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, game three, excuse game me, three, yeah. they came out flat and just stayed that way. Like Marcus Smart came in and didn't even give him didn't give him a boost. Like when you when you see that happen, you know something's wrong. Right. Um, and game so the game three, they just didn't have it. And then game four, I thought they made a lot of stupid mistakes, like just doing some really dumb stuff. I, I, like the one thing that stood out, well, the, the the easy ones were saving the ball under the under the Cavs basket twice for, yeah. that produced two layups. But the other thing in the first quarter, the Cavs were in the bonus and they fouled them three times away from the basket, like not even on the Cavs weren't even going to the basket or anything. And gave them free throws, three trip, you know, three free trips to the line. It's just a lot of stupid stuff, and so I think it's just perspective. And I, I wanted, sort of wanted to ask one of them, like, when you look at this discrepancy, do you see is, is wow, we're playing great at home, and oh man, if we just you know take care of home, we're we're in great shape, or do you think like, is is the road performance more of a disappointment? It's so strange too watching these series, you know, from afar you know because i'm watching body language and you know it's it's great the people you get to talk to scouts uh, just other people who are observing the same stuff and uh and a scout who who was at at the game and at the western conference uh finals made it a point to ask you know when when has any guy ever sat on the scores table and guzzled water the way LeBron did the other night. Like he doesn't do any, we know he, he knows that he's, there's a camera on him at all times. So he's never doing anything unconsciously or subconsciously. It's always knowing that you're on. He's been this way since he was 16. How much of the dramatics from LeBron the other night do you think were put a put on? Like how much of that was him, playing to the narrative and the cameras and and then of course after the game i'm i'm not tired i'm fine it's like well 
you're the same guy we just saw out there bent over, you know, blowing your suit cooler, sucking air, trying to catch any possible, you know, morsel of breath, you know, to keep up in this game. And then you come in afterwards and like, I'm fine. I'm not tired. I mean, I don't know about him playing to the narrative, but I'll just tell you this. In the first half, so in the conference finals, in the first half of the five games, he has an effective field goal percentage of 70%. In the second half, he has an effective field goal percentage of 46%. Wow. In the first half of games, the Cavs have scored 108 points per 100 possessions, which is above average. Not, mm-hmm. you know, not nearly what they they scored in, in against Toronto, but right. um, good against the number one defense in the league. In the second, so 108 in the first half. The second half, 93, 93 points, which is beyond awful. Mm-hmm. So there's a big difference just when you look over the five games overall, you know, forgetting home and road, um, in how well they performed early in games versus late in games. Sure. So both LeBron and the team as a, as a group have been running out of gas. And, and and the numbers are worse in the fourth quarter than they are in the third quarter, too. So. Right. Um, it, do, uh, is this the part where we throw Ty Lue under the bus for the minutes and point fingers at him and how he's getting worked by Brad Stevens? Or is this... I mean, what are his options? Like, is he supposed to play Jordan Clarkson and Rodney Hood more minutes? I don't, I don't think that's a viable option, mm-hmm. you know? Um, I think... You know, I think LeBron is basically calling his own minutes. You know, uh, in the other night, Ty Lue took him out with two and a half minutes or so left in the third and said, and then, you know, to hopefully have him come back uh, to start the fourth. But LeBron said no and said uh, said he wasn't ready to start the fourth. He came back, I don't know, a minute or two in, into the fourth quarter. So I think both to start the second and to start the fourth, it's basically LeBron's call as far as when he comes back in the game. And Ty Lewis obviously got to sort of make do uh, without him. So so many people have decided that Ty Lue is going to, you know, there's always somebody who has to be the scapegoat when things go wrong, you know. And (laughs) it's funny. Ty Lue was the worst coach in the history of basketball, uh, you know, during games one and two. They go back to Cleveland Win three and four, and I did not hear a person utter a single word about Brad Stevens being a brilliant coach during when they when the Celtics are getting mopped. But no, you know, nobody gave Ty Lue any credit, of course. But the, the I think people gave him credit. I think the uh, Stevens is a I brilliant think, genius coach in, narrative, like went away completely. During I don't. Games I mean, I don't know. I try to avoid the the brilliant genius coach story. You know, so do I. When, I, I, when don't, I'm, I don't go for when it. When I'm writing, I know that. Um, you know, we talk about stuff. Amongst us as writers, I think we gave credit to Ty Lue in general for the Tristan Thompson change in the starting lineup. I think mm-hmm. that helped them in games three and four. Thompson was great. And then we saw uh, Boston adjust in game five, going with Bain in part to play big at the start to, to so that you know the Cavs weren't playing big versus small, but also it helped their rotation afterwards. Um, Nobody uttered the G word, though. Nobody uttered genius about these moves. You know, when Brad Stevens makes an adjustment, it's brilliant. When the other coach makes an adjustment, it's like, eh, well, you know, he kind (laughs) of... And I think uh, people jumped on Ty Lue also with the Ojale corver thing after game five, where Corver did not play at all in the first quarter. um, And then, uh, so his minutes were chopped a little bit. And somebody asked him about it and he says, well, we usually tell, I think, you know, we usually, uh, Corver comes in when Ojale comes in and since Ojale didn't play, right. uh, that threw us off. And so I think that's, that's a tough one. They didn't really get very many minutes with LeBron, uh, Kevin Love and Corver on the floor together as a trio. And that's their best offensive trio. Mm. Obviously it's a defensive issue. Uh, when Corver's out there and the, the Celtics have been trying to attack him with Jalen Brown uh, mostly. Um, and so uh, you have to worry about that end of the floor. But at times, you know, I think Cleveland's best option has just been to go with their best offensive lineups and, 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 and try to score. Right. Tell me this, John Schumann. Let's, let's, let's just quit playing around. Tell me this. <laughs> How do the Boston Celtics win tonight, Friday night, 830 Quicken Loans Arena, Game 6, Eastern Conference Finals. How do they do it? How do they break this thing up, this home road 
dynamic they have and win this series. Get it over with. They Listen, I know it sounds good in theory. Hey, we got a game seven at the garden if, if needed, and we never lose game sevens at the – I don't want I don't want to see LeBron James in a game seven anywhere if I'm Cleveland. I mean, if I'm Boston, how do they finish Cleveland off in Cleveland tonight? Well, first of all, I mean, I'm not a shoot around. We're talking right now. The Celtics are shooting around. But I would have I was Brad Stevens. I would have went to the hardware store and bought a tape measure. <laughs> I would have taken the tape measure to shoot around this morning with my team. I would have put Ollie on strapped shoulders, you know, told them that, hey, the rim is 10 feet high. Right. And break out the tape measure again. Say the free throw line is still 15 feet from the basket. <laughs> the dimensions are the same. You know, there's no uh, there's no difference. You know, between the the lines, the court is the same size. The lines are the same. You know, it's the same court as we play back in Boston. Sure. And uh, it's got to be a mental thing because, like I said, I think their performance was just uncharacteristic in three and four. So I think if they execute the way they can. Um, if they don't panic, I think they're in, they're in good shape. It's, it's, it's gotta be a mental thing. I think you gotta, I think you'll see it. Mm -hmm. Tatum is the guy I think to focus on. He's the one that sort of struggled in, in games three and four. Um, Rozier is another one. He didn't have a good game five either, but they were able to overcome that. I think those are the two guys. I think you just focus on and see if these guys have it. And then, you know, they can win. They can win in this gym. They can beat the Cavs in anywhere they play. It's just a matter of them executing um, and defending the way they can. Yeah. Is it, if if we had to go back and, and vote on rookie of the year for the entire <laughs> span of the season, I'm just, this is hypothetical. Would, would it, would Jalen, would, would Jason Tatum's playoffs trump anything that Ben Simmons or Donovan Mitchell did? to vault him maybe higher on your ballot for rookie of the year? I think a question. Mitchell had himself some playoff moments. He did. Um, he did. Simmons was really good in the first uh, round, obviously not very good in the second round. That's a good question. I don't know. That, it would make it a lot tougher just to, you know, it, all three of them would be close. Because in my ballot after the regular season, I thought it was a clear Simmons one, Mitchell two, Tatum mm -hmm. three. I thought that was, you know, and there was, I had no um, hesitation in, in putting any of those names in those spots. So, like, right now, like, if you said, all right, who's the rookie of the year over the whole thing, it, they would be – three of them would be pretty even in my mind. Yeah. You uh, know? Ted has been just un he, unreal in this – in in the playoffs. Even the struggles, which you expect. He's a rookie. You expect him to struggle, you know, at some point on the road, whatever. But to bounce back the way he does – um, and they've run. I mean, they. I've said before they've run fourth they quarter go, offense. Yeah, they go them, through which them, is yeah. something they were never doing early yeah. in the season, or even you know midway through the season. And it, it's, that's that's completely brand new. And he's handled it pretty well in some spots. Um, he got pretty frustrated in games three and four. So I, yeah. I, you know, with with sort of the the physicality of off ball defense that the Cavs brought in games three and four. You know, the clutching yeah. and grabbing and making it difficult for him to, to, to run off the screens and, sure. and, and, and where he wants to and, and sort of pushing him away from the basket. So I'll be curious to see how he handles that tonight. If, any, if anything, I think what shines a light on Brad, Brad Stevens' brilliance as a coach is that he's got the guts to play through his young guys the way he has. There are a lot of coaches. I'm watching one of them whose, whose team is up in the Western Conference Finals. But if Mike D'Antoni's rotation gets any tighter, they're gonna have to play like eight man basketball. Like he's I don't know if he trusts anybody outside of those seven guys he's using. But Stevens is not afraid to to reach out and let a twenty year old kid be their catalyst, which is I mean, it's just awesome to watch. Um, you know, very awesome to watch that. Um let's I mean and, and again, game six tonight. On ESPN, 8.30, 8.30 Eastern. LeBron's season either moves on to a to an unbelievable Game 7 in the Conference Finals or his run in Cleveland, his his finals run, you know, in Miami and Cleveland, seven straight years, comes to an end. You and Steve Ashburn will be there. By the way, very impressed post-game. My dad asked me, he's like, yeah, I saw Schumann and the old guy. 
called Ashburn Yoga. I didn't have the heart to tell him, dude, he's about your age. Like you, you guys are contemporaries. Um, but, uh, he was, he was like, yeah, he's like, I like the questions they asked after the game. You guys are the only two people whose questions he liked after the game. He's, he's getting worn out on some of the LeBron. Can you rate that dunk on your all time dunks? I mean, some of the, they, some of these guys are in the bag now. They're deep in the LeBron bag in the post game. I, it's scary. It's, it's a little uh, frightening. Yeah, I mean, I gotta give credit. Like we talked about him being worn out. Like the story right. I wrote after Game Five is that like heck, he doesn't have like the the Cavs miss Kyrie Irving more than the Celtics because mm-hmm. he doesn't have somebody else who can create something in that offense, and that may be why they they lose. You know, that and why me. that finals run comes to an end because he had in Miami, he had Dwayne Wade the last three years, he had Kyrie Irving, and now he doesn't, and maybe that's the end of it. So we'll see. That works for me. He's your guy, and I and I know it had to break your heart to see him, you know, tweak that hamstring last night. You know, in in the last minute, I I'll just ask if he doesn't, if Chris Paul doesn't play in Game Six. If he's hampered for Game Six and and potentially a Game Seven, is there any way the Rockets can win this series and get to the finals? I, I don't know. I mean, you're you were you're there, but like the one thing that stood out for me in these last two games is their defense more than anything. They've held the Warriors um, under a hundred, under uh, yeah, under a point for possession too. Just yeah. like if you just want to take pace into account, and the defense down the stretch of of Game Four was incredible. Um, you know, the Warriors make you work like yeah. even though we're in this sort of switching thing and and, uh, you know, everything, all screens are switched and it becomes a one on one thing. The Warriors still move a lot more than the Rockets do. They'll bring three guys together and then split them apart. And so communication and, and knowing who's got who um, after screens is critical. Um, and it ha- can happen so fast. And if you lose one guy, you know, you get punished for it. And, you know, they've lost guys on occasion. Like the Warriors have missed some open looks um, down the stretch of these last two games. But I've been really impressed with how well the, the Rockets have been able to sort of scramble through all the Warriors' actions and stay attached to all these guys and, at worst, you know, run them off the line and, and sort of overplay the three-point line and, and force them going towards the basket. You know, that takes, like, multiple efforts on every possession. Like, the Rockets were a very good defensive team in the regular season, but I've been – but this – they've taken things to a new level on that end of the floor these last two games especially. We owe Daryl Morey an apology, a bunch of us. Um, <laughs> no, really, because people have been making fun of Morey, you know, for years. He gets a lot of love from certain corners of the basketball world, but there are, <laughs> there are yeah. a lot of people, yeah. cynical people, who have said all of this – Everything that Maury's done has, you know, been in the, you know, against the grain of what some of the traditionalists believe. Shoot, they they got Mike D'Antoni playing an offensive style that is completely foreign to what his DNA is. They they have embraced iso ball with. I mean, when Chris Paul is backing up to near half court so he can charge at a you know a bigger Warriors defender. It is the epitome of iso ball. It was like I was transported back to my teenage years watching this game last night because it was just I know it's I know it's a taboo topic, but it was hero ball at its finest and it worked. Like worked it worked. Enough, yeah. I, I and everybody keeps, you know, what oh, do you really think the Rockets can win? How many times do you have to watch a team do what they've done in question whether yeah obviously they can win this series. I know, I know the Warriors are incredulous and think, well, we've, you know, we blew these last two games. We'll get things right for game six. We'll definitely be back here for game seven. Like the, I understand why they have that sort of bravado. They, when you've won as much as they have, you should feel that way. But at some point, the reality is the Rockets have outplayed you two games in a row. Um, outside of that 41 point smoking you put on them, you haven't dominated them. You have, you know, if you're the Warriors, there's. I almost get this feeling like they act like, yeah, hey, we're just, you know, one play away from dominating this team. You haven't dominated them the way you think you have, the way you probably feel you have, because you've missed opportunities or you've 
stumble down the stretch. I would tell you that all of the winning the Warriors have done, Shu, has come back to bite them. They haven't been in a ton of close, important games the past four years. They, you know, and really the only one that was do or die, yeah. they lost. Yeah, on their home floor, if I'm not mistaken, right? Correct. Okay. Um, yeah, I keep coming back to this team was 15 and 0 in last year's playoffs. You know, unbelievable. Um, yeah, and finished 16 and one, and you know they've lost now three times in uh, in four games. You know. Um, you know, it was weird. I'm going to tell you, and it's probably a lot of people wouldn't want to hear this, was the looks on faces in the hallways after that game last night. And I'm talking not Warriors players per se, but the people that are around some of the Warriors players. I'm not going to say names, but I'm telling you, there were some key figures who are, you know, very instrumental in the in the lives of some of those Warriors players and they had a look on their face that did not on their faces that did not say, Oh, we're fine, that we got this, we'll just go back home and get it right for game six and come back. It was this look of like, man, are, have they have the Rockets found, you know, uh the sweet spot to to beating us. You know, you don't do that you do it once, it's that's one thing. You beat a team down the stretch, they they struggle, make bad decisions, don't make plays. Game Game five was worse to me was worse than game four at the end for the Warriors. I mean, there was just multiple. Quinn Cook pass, yeah, looking, you know, passes like, yeah, up a three. So shots in, then at he the takes end of game one. five. Like yeah. Draymond had a three. Uh, Curry had a layup, but basically, uh, otherwise, the last three minutes were Draymond shooting and Quinn Cook shooting. Yeah, and then Draymond dropping the ball on the. Uh, yeah, and and I know I know it's not chic to to try you know to be the guy who in this moment says well what about but man what about what about your late game management as a coaching staff like timeouts that could have been called that weren't yeah i thought they made a mistake in the end of game four not calling timeout yeah um and and like you don't have to call timeout right away you can you can see what you have in 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 a in transition and then call timeout you know we see coaches do that all the time you know, if you see a guy's in trouble, call timeout. You still got eight seconds, seven seconds left or whatever it is uh, to draw something up. You know, it's not FIBA ball where you're not allowed to take a timeout in the middle of a possession. So. All right. And, I, and look, I want to make sure we give credit to the teams playing at this stage of the season. This, you know, this is what playoff basketball, Michael Lee and I were, and, and Michael Wilbon were standing around last night talking right after the game down in the press room. And and Wilbon made a great point. He was like, you know, this is what playoff basketball is supposed to be. It's, it, he's like, the best players don't get what they want all the time. You know, they don't get the ball in the spots they want because the defense is that good. Like, yeah. that was commonplace in the pre-pace and space era, that the defender was taking away what you like best. I always think about Kobe Bryant, that game seven against the Celtics, and Sean and Powell and I were doing, we were down there at Staples. He was having the worst game seven performance that I can remember for a elite all time superstar player. Like it literally took Ron Artest, Powell Gasol and some other dudes to, to bail the Lakers out because Boston was hell bent on not letting Kobe Bryant beat them. You know what I mean? Like that's what the, isn't this what the, the other team is supposed to do? When you know when it's a even matchup and everything's on the line, you shouldn't get easy, wide open shots or get what you want. Durant took every shot he took in the fourth quarter of Game Five was an off balance. Uh, you know yep. he 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 never was comfortable or set or looked firm in how he was attacking the basket. But that was Rockets defense. That wasn't just KD deciding I'm going to throw up some craziness. Yeah, that was defense. Yeah, Ariza has been fantastic. I think Gordon has been really good defensively, not just on the ball, but just like I said, you know, these guys switching with without making too many mistakes against this team. Like you make too many mistakes, this team, you're dead. And like I said, they've just switched with uh, to almost, you know, almost they've been almost perfect in their late game switches as far as you know, scrambling and and taking away. Uh, 
open shots and, and rhythm shots, really. You know, the, the, they've, that's, the, that's the key. It's not necessarily open, but also in rhythm. Um, you take away those look, that's impressive against the Warriors. And I think, like you said, like whoever comes out of this series, the story should be about that team and how well they played to get there more than the other team failing. You know, like we yeah. always have that sort of perspective. If you don't win the championship, you're a failure. But that's that's that won't be the case in this series, especially. No, I agree. West Conference Finals has been an eye opener. Um, and shout out to Eric Gordon. I, I was texting with uh, Nia Juneal, who works uh, for NBA TV. I'm gonna out her right now because she's a big, t- you know, she's from Houston, big time Rockets fan. And we both were talking about the fact that Eric Gordon gets 20 in the playoffs. Mark it down, maybe the Rockets are winning. <laughs> so we, I'm serious. I was like, man, if they don't get Eric Gordon another shot, get Eric Gordon. He, had, he was on 14, then he got up to like 19. It was like, man, get Eric Gordon the ball. He got he crossed 20. It was a wrap. I literally text. Was yeah. that the one that near the end? That, yes. I mean, that was the biggest shot of the night. Right? Yes. basically, right. Yes. And I was, I mean, I was, and give Harden credit on that play too. He he uh, he didn't settle for a setback <laughs> three. Right. He, he, he put the ball on the floor, got into the paint, drew a deep defender, and got um, Gordon an open and, like I said, in rhythm look. Yes. Uh, and that was the biggest shot. They made it a four point game, I believe, at the time. Game six of the Western Conference Finals, Saturday night, 9 o'clock Eastern on TNT from Oracle Arena. You're crazy. You can complain all season long about the NBA, but if you don't tune into these next two games, you're out of your mind. This is. This is why you watch on a Saturday night in January, you know, teams that you may or may not care about watching. This is why you are a fan of the NBA, because game six of the Eastern Conference Finals, Friday night, 830 on ESPN, game six of the Western Conference Finals, nine o'clock Eastern on TNT. These are the games you wait all season for, and they're going to have all the drama you could ask for, seasons on the line, legacies changing. We'll know more later about Chris Paul's injury and what his availability is. Same goes for Andre Iguodala, who I'm sure will be back and healthy for Game 6 of the Western Conference Finals. I can't wait. Shoot, next time we talk, or at least next time we talk on, on the Hangtime Podcast here, we'll be somewhere for the finals. Houston? I don't know. Okay. It's got to be, I mean, I don't know. Wherever it is, the first unsweet tea or whatever beverage of your choice is on me. um, We'll see if Hartzell can come up with some decent equipment for us on the road um, because we're not going to have the luxury of being in the studio here and with Hannah running the show with me sitting right here and them cleaning up all my mistakes. So it'll be a remote operation from the finals wherever we are. So if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to The Hang Time on Apple Podcasts for new episodes all finals long. We're going to be there um, live from the finals we'll have some special guests i'm sure as well don't forget to leave a review and enjoy what we've waited all season long for in the eastern conference finals western conference finals this weekend it's a holiday weekend for more reasons than one it's it's a basketball holiday weekend and i hope you enjoy it we'll see you right here next week on the hang time podcast Thanks for listening to the Hang Time Podcast, and be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts for a new episode every Thursday this season. And as always, say kuna matata.